Now, every genre has a certain set of expectations which engenders it to an audience, and there's good reason that these cliches and reliable tropes have become so popular in the first place. Nobody wants a rom-com wherein there's no triumphant kiss in the film's closing moments, and nobody wants to see a slasher movie without any masked murderer to slice their way through a set of interchangeable teen victims. But sometimes, subverting audiences' expectations can be as effective as playing into them, and some films break all of the rules of their subgenre so hard that they end up redefining the parameters of what can be achieved within the framework. So let's take a look at them today as I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are horror movies that broke all the rules. Invasion of the Body Snatchers Prior to the 70s, between the influence of the censorious Hayes Code and the patriotic thought policing of the HUAC, sci-fi movies, like most Hollywood productions, were forced to ensure that their endings were happy and morally unambiguous. This resulted in some surreal scenes like the original 1956 Invasion of the Body Snatchers closing on the bleak image of its protagonist unable to convince the authorities detaining him of the alien threat that was currently and insidiously invading their community. That is until two random blokes stroll in inside the precinct with alien pods in tow to say he's not actually crazy, let's go get these aliens and the day is saved. Well, the same can't be said in the 1978 remake of the same name. Ending on a brutally downbeat note as Donald Sutherland's hero is revealed to have been assimilated by the threat, this quintessentially 70s redo set the tone for the decade's bleaker and darker style of sci-fi horror alongside the more disturbing and hopeless likes of A Clockwork Orange and THX 1138. Attack the Block Released in 2011, British cult filmmaker Joe Cornish's still underrated sci-fi horror Attack the Block was an unexpected hit which actually rewrote the rules of British genre cinema. The flick came at the end of a long string of films from the country which envisioned unsupervised youths as monstrous, amoral murderers. A trend evidenced by everything from 2005's pretentious indie drama The Great Ecstasy of Robert Carmichael to 2008's torture porn horror Eden Lake to 2010's tense thriller F. Starring future Star Wars hero John Boyega as its stoic protagonist, Attack the Block recast these air quotes hoodie villains of these horrors as misunderstood heroes, depicting the challenges of their low-income lives before leading the audience to root for them against a toothy alien menace. Charming, scary, and funny, this flick ensured the less privileged denizens of Britain got their turn to play heroes on screen. Now where's that movement to cast the rich kids as villains some 10 years on, I ask ya? Apollo 18. Now listen, just because the films on this list List rewrote the rulebook doesn't mean that they're all perfect. Case in point, Apollo 18 was a 2011 effort which brought the found footage format into space for the first time. Taking the exploitable, a handful of camcorder wielding protagonists accidentally documenting their eventual doom format from the likes of the Blair Witch Project and Paranormal Activity and fusing it with alien space based isolated monster horror antics. The film, which follows the titular fictional mission to the moon, sees its stars uncover some alien crab monsters and get off one by one. Standard found footage fashion, but as unremarkable a flick as this one may be, it still marked the first big-budget major studio fusion of found footage horror and space set sci-fi. So at least it's got that going for it. Society Released to, let's face it, little acclaim in 1990, but revisited as a cult classic ever since, Society was reanimator director Brian Yusner's seminal sci-fi horror story of a young man who discovers the horrific truth behind his upper-crust adopted family's lifestyle in rather gruesome fashion. The film's central mystery is a slice of fun and offers up impressively uncompromising class-based satire, but technically that had already been established in the sci-fi horror genre ever since aliens mocked arms manufacturers and Robocop took aim at the militarization of the US police. But what society did do to change up the subgenre was stretching the limitations of what practical effects work could achieve into daring, terrifying new places, pushing past even the earlier innovations of the Thing mastermind Rob Bottin, screaming mad George's incredible prosthetic effects work reimagined the scope of special effects shortly before CGI would come in to replace many of his own innovations via paltry, depthless imitations. 28 Days Later Okay, so in abstract, what if zombies but quick doesn't exactly sound like the most extraordinary sci-fi horror innovation, but train spotting director Danny Boyle's propulsive horror thriller 28 Days Later, based on a script by ex machina scribe Alex Garland, went on to redefine the design of The Walking Dead on screen ever since its 2000 
ordered to release. This tense sci-fi horror reanimated the zombie subgenre through the small but pivotal innovation of speeding up its infamously shambolic villains. This zombie horror turned The Walking Dead into The Running Dead and tripled their potential for terror in the process, resulting in a string of later flicks ranging from the mega-budget blockbuster World War Z to Zack Snyder's 2004 Dawn of the Dead remake repeating this rather nifty trick. Monsters Despite its title, 2010's Monsters didn't actually have a lot to do with the eponymous beasts, although they did lay waste to a few major cities off-screen. Instead, this indie from future Godzilla helmer Gareth Edwards all but ignored the titular beasts and focused on the small-scale personal drama of two mismatched survivors played to perfection by Whitney Abel and Scoot McNary. As a photographer and his boss's daughter, this pair had chemistry to spare, and by envisioning a monster movie apocalypse through their intimate, limited view of it, Edwards' film upended the cliches of earlier giant monster movies such as the then-recent Cloverfield to create a more affecting, evocative image of a world in turmoil. Life Again, as mentioned earlier in this list, not all the movies here are perfect, although this underrated gem is a lot better than the likes of Apollo 18. With a cracking cast including Jake Gyllenhaal and Rebecca Ferguson, 2017's intense alien knockoff life is blessed with some killer spooky sequences and an inventive monster design in the form of the ever-evolving Calvin. The film may suffer with a pointlessly bleak ending worthy of the outer limits, but nonetheless this one elevated itself by breaking one of the cardinal rules of sci-fi horror. Inspired by Alien's daring decision to off John Hurt in its opening sequences, Life audaciously kills off megastar Deadpool actor Ryan Reynolds almost immediately, leaving audiences shaken and uncertain who, if anyone, is safe from this flick. Pandorum. Initially looking like just another Aliens clone, 2009's Pandorum didn't win over many viewers and was largely relegated to cult movie obscurity since its release. It's a shame as well as this twisty flick is an effective two-hander whose action is split between a nervy Ben Foster and an older, wiser Dennis Quaid as the only waking inhabitants of a ship set to bring humankind to a faraway planet in order to begin a repopulation project. Or so it seems. Without any massive spoilers, suffice to say this sci-fi horror soon reveals its human heroes are much more evil than any monster on board, with a barnstorming subversive twist which marks it out as a more thoughtful and interesting film than many other comparable entries into the genre. John Carpenter's The Thing A rare remake which managed to wholly outstrip its original inspiration, Halloween director John Carpenter's 1982 masterpiece The Thing pushed the boundaries of what effects could achieve whilst its enigmatic ending left viewers not sure who, if anyone, was left to root for. Combining the aforementioned 70s paranoia with the incredible advancements in special effects technology achieved by a then only 23-year-old Rob Bottin, The Thing brought sci-fi horror as a genre into a far darker and more disturbing territory than even the likes of Alien and the Invasion of the Body Snatchers managed to achieve. By the close of Carpenter's horrifically gory cinematic nightmare, there was no unambiguously good characters left to root for, and the audience was left with no clue who to trust, a twist which epitomized the politically charged bleakness and anger that pervaded many of Carpenter's subsequent films, as well as the sci-fi horror genre as a whole. Under the Skin Released in 2014 to critical acclaim and mainstream disinterest, Under the Skin is a rare cinematic effort from birth helmer Jonathan Glazer, and is as frustratingly impossible to categorize in generic terms as the rest of his output. This artsy effort takes the perspective of the alien air quote monster rather than its human victims completely rewriting the rules of alien invasion movies by centering the invader as the protagonist through whose eyes the viewer sees the film's world. And it is a brutal world wherein humans are often as evil, if not worse, than this immoral alien, resulting in a sobering slice of sci-fi horror destined to leave viewers wondering about society, culture, gender, and individual responsibility. Not bad for a film that, let's face it, if we're being honest, could be accurately summarised as Scottish Species. It's Alive Directed by the infamous B-movie icon Larry Cohen, who brought us such esteemed efforts as Q, The Winged Serpent and The Stuff, It's Alive is an effort from 1974 which managed to make a movie monster out of the horrors of parenting. Metaphorically speaking, that is. In literal terms, the movie's monster is a baby. Sure, it's a mutant baby, but this was still a pretty audacious move for a creature feature to feature a killer infant as its antagonist. 
Long before Lord of the Rings director Peter Jackson would tread similar territory with his far sillier brain dead, this daring flick opted to take the idea of a killer cannibal baby dead seriously and created an agreeable slice of schlock in the process. It's a film so solid that it managed to spawn, because it's a baby, <laughs> get it? A handful of sequels and a 2009 remake. The flick is also notable for somehow garnering a PG rating upon its US release, despite the plot concerning, well, again, a man-eating killer baby. Bit of an oversight on the part of the famously squeamish family values friendly MPAA there. Pitch Black Directed by a perfect getaway creator, David Twoey, Pitch Black was a thrilling sci-fi horror from 2000 which flipped the script of its bigger budget predecessors in the subgenre such as Alien and The Thing. Stranding a set of mismatched survivors on a desolate desert planet where night lasts a lot longer than on Earth and brings with it a flood of monsters who can only attack under cover of darkness, this intense flick remains underrated and went on to facilitate the creation of the Chronicles of Riddick series. The Vin Diesel vehicle features a strong no-nonsense heroine played by Silent Hill heroine Rada Mitchell who proves to be cunning and resilient through the film's runtime. Resourceful and daring, this Ripley alike is the obvious candidate for anti-heroine of the flick, which meant all Audiences were blindsided when she ended up brutally killed seconds before the closing credits, skewered by hubris. It's a devastating and unexpected twist, and it's one which solidifies this flick as a subversive entry into the monster movie canon. Rawhead Rex Now listen, no one guaranteed that these would all be stone-cold classics just because they're all creature features which broke the mold and offered something truly new. Recently spotlighted by YouTube critics slash amateur film historians Red Letter Media, 1986's Rawhead Rex is the infamous Ireland set flick which prompted Hellraiser author Clive Barker to insist that he retain creative control on any later adaptations of his work. Make no mistake, the original short story does feature a penis-headed demon, so the jury's out on whether this could ever have worked on screen. But whilst this quintessentially 80s slice of rural horror is pretty laughable at times, it did cross a line by offing one of the hero's kids early in proceedings. The eponymous monster tears his way through a rural village with wanton bloody abandon, but none of the gory massacres prepared viewers for the thankfully off-screen scene wherein the titular terror kills and eats a small child. Silly as the rest of the film can be, it's hard not to admire its daring in this surprisingly effective sequence. Altitude as iconic as cosmic horror icon slash problematic literary figure H.P. Lovecraft's work is, precious few films have endeavoured to realise the planet-sized monsters which lurk throughout his work on the cinema screen. 2020's Underwater may have given viewers a glimpse of Cthulhu, but an inability to effectively portray these apparently vast monsters hobbled Guillermo del Toro's slated adaptation of At the Mountains of Madness and led the creators of Cabin in the Woods to settle for a giant hand in their place. This underrated Lovecraftian horror from 2010 sees a small group besieged by an impossibly huge monster, while stuck on a plane thousands of feet in the air. This clever premise means viewers see virtually nothing of the monsters outside for much of the flick's runtime. Instead, the filmmakers employ the same stylistic tricks as former Walking Dead showrunner Frank Darabont's Stephen King adaptation The Mist, glimpsing only occasional tentacles and eyes to imply the size of the thing. However, by the film's close, much like The Mist, Altitude does offer a good look at its reimagining of Cthulhu, and the tentacled terror is well worth the wait. Isolation Released in 2005, Isolation is an Irish indie horror with one of the most impressive, if tiny, casts in the genre's history. Featuring preachers Ruth Nager, the Babadook's Essa Davis, and Possum's unsettling screen presence Sean Harris, this flick makes for a terrifying slice of remote rural horror as it sees its small but starry cast of characters attempt to escape a largely unseen mutant threat. And it's just as well said Monster remains largely unseen, as Isolation's antagonist is genuinely terrifying despite its uh, unexpected origin. You see, the effectively tense indie horror broke the creature feature cardinal rules by having the gall to make a dead serious and seriously scary monster out of a killer cow. Yes, you heard me right. And yes, the film does really manage to make this bloodthirsty monstrosity into a genuinely terrifying threat, an audacious experiment which goes to show a truly talented filmmaker can wring fear from almost anything. Bravo, I am not a serial killer helmet, Billy O'Brien. Feast. It doesn't get much more rule-breaking than messily offing the film's self-described hero and obvious leading man a few seconds after he's introduced, does it? 
Feast was the feature film project which the third season of Good Will Hunting star Matt Damon's Project Greenlight, a reality TV series which pitted potential filmmakers against one another to fight for production resources, centred around. The 2005 horror comedy really pulls no punches, going so far as to introduce Grey's Anatomy star Eric Dane in the role of hero as a handy on-screen graphic informs viewers and have him utter the line, I'm the guy that's gonna save your ass, before immediately being beheaded by the monstrous clawed antagonists of the film. It's a hilariously subversive start to proceedings which ensures viewers know this film will be disregarding any genre rulebook and operating entirely on its own twisted blackly comic logic from here on out. It's just a shame that Paul McSteamy needed to lose his head for that point to become clear. The Ritual most films in the folk horror subgenre don't bother trying to include an actual monster in their action. Instead, the likes of The Wicker Man and Midsummer opt to make the overzealous cultists that their stories centre around the antagonists. Shout out to the Stephen King adaptation Children of the Corn for attempting to do both at once and featuring a monster as well as its young villains. It failed disastrously and became laughable, but props for trying nonetheless. However, 2017's The Ritual, directed by the signal helmer David Bruckner, combined elements of the folk horror subgenre with a new and truly surreal monster of its own in order to reignite interest in both folk horror and the creature feature subgenre at once. Unwinding at a slow pace and grounding its small cast of lost friends in recognisable reality, this one succeeds thanks to its stunning, strange creature design and the gradual build-up to its eventual full-scale reveal. Burning Bright Named after a line in William Blake's famous poem The Tiger, Burning Bright is an underrated 2010 indie horror which follows a young woman who is besieged by a big cat with meat on its mind in her remote country home. The film from quid pro quo director Carlos Brooks sees the heroine attempt to save herself and her autistic sibling from the massive beast. However, whilst the movie may feature a man-eating tiger, the twisty narrative soon reveals that one human character is far more evil than any big cat. Yes, it's the trope that we all know and love. This monster movie flips the script on the creature feature subgenre by having humans and one bastard in particular be the real villains. It's a perfect setup for a thrilling siege horror which ends on one of the genre's most cathartic denouements and makes for an effective slice of eco-horror which is more thoughtful and animal-friendly than most entries in the genre. Troll Hunter Released in 2010, Troll Hunter is a superb found footage satire which turns the conventions of the monster movie genre on its head. A flick which manages to be both a warm-hearted send-up of creature features and a pretty effective one in its own right, the film follows a set of film students as they accidentally uncover and endeavour to make a documentary about the titular Troll Hunter. A stoic anti-hero who has spent years offing the mythological beasts of Norwegian folklore as his day job, the eponymous character takes them on an adventure which deconstructs not only the subgenre which brought us the Blair Witch Project, but also the monster movie's reliable tropes too. A deadpan satire of the creature feature, this flick was set after its breakout success to be remade by Home Alone director Chris Columbus's production company, with the Descent director Neil Marshall at the helm. However, the project fell apart, meaning this charming and clever flick remains the definitive portrait of cinematic troll hunting, as well as a testament to the monster movie's format's potential for subversive invention. Starry Eyes Body horror and possession go hand in hand. After all, a huge part of the horror of the latter films come from how the demonic entity transforms its host physically. Facial scars, forked tongues, and green skin all reflect the manifestation of evil housed within the human body. So it's no surprise that eventually directors would take this idea one step further and forefront the Cronenberg-style body horror. Enter Starry Eyes. Here, an aspiring actress named Sarah is noticed by a creepy-looking casting director. She's invited to a couple of auditions, but in each one experiences some kind of supernatural phenomenon. After this, the closer she gets to bagging the role, the more her body starts to degrade and her sanity starts to slip. Ultimately, it turns out that she isn't being courted for a movie role at all, but rather to be the vessel for a demon. It's a supremely chilling story with enough gross out moments to keep your head in the toilet for a whole month afterwards, but Starry Eyes is undeniably an original spin on the classic cult possession horror trope. The Exorcism of Emily Rose I don't think any horror fan in the world looked at The Exorcist and said, you know, this is great and all, but it would be even better if half of it was in a courtroom. Well, apparently that's exactly what director Scott Derrickson thought and in response gave the world The Exorcism of Emily Rose in 2005. And to his credit, the mixture actually worked better than anyone could have anticipated. Emily Rose managed to stand out from the crowd because in this movie, the titular exorcism had already happened. The young girl 
girl had died and the priest was on trial for his actions. Told non-linearly, with the court hearing and the build-up to the exorcism itself happening simultaneously, it managed to show a completely different side to the regular possession story, and dove into the fallout of such an event. How much responsibility does the priest bear for the death? Were demonic forces really involved? Should the family have provided a better duty of care? All of these elements are interrogated with surprising dramatic depth, and the emotional haunting of the exorcism after the fact is just as scary as the act itself. Prince of Darkness. Prince of Darkness posits a pretty peculiar question. That being, what if Satan was actually just a big tankard of sentient green goo rather than the horny red devil that we've come to know him as? Yep, that's right, in this forgotten John Carpenter gem, the villain of the piece is the devil himself, but not as he's usually perceived. Here, he's a formless liquid that can possess hapless victims who come into contact with his, uh, substance. The idea is that he's after a perfect vessel to house his essence, and the church, along with a few university academics, are trying to study and stop him. Now, if that doesn't already sound like a premise thought up after a few too many not cigarettes, let me add the final wrinkle to this tale. It turns out that there's someone actually worse than Satan himself in this universe, and that is the Anti-God. Transporting this evil being to Satan's dimension is the endgame, and all the hell on earth carnage that would come with it. So yeah, name a possession movie weirder than this one. The Exorcist 3. The Exorcist 3 broke the rules of the possession movie so much that the studio actually had to step in, chop it up, and order more scenes so it more neatly fit into the genre. That's because, despite bearing the name, this third film wasn't supposed to feature an exorcism at all. Instead, the intention was to make a more psychologically driven thriller that didn't resort to the pea soup antics of its famous predecessor. Instead, inspired by the Zodiac Killer, the bulk of the story focuses on the mystery of the Gemini Killer returning from the grave and continuing his spree over a decade after his supposed demise. The question is how he's managed to come back and whether a demon was responsible for the crimes the entire time. By request of the studio, there's ultimately a more concrete answer to this mystery and an explosive blockbuster friendly finale, but that doesn't stop the rest of the movie from subverting your expectations at every step. Generally as well, the Exorcist series in its entirety never played it safe when it came to genre conventions, which is why it's such a shame that this is the only good sequel, The Wailing. Across its two and a half hour runtime, The Wailing floats between a bunch of different horror subgenres. However, it's demonic possession that takes the focus in the final stretch, when it's revealed that a strange virus sweeping across a South Korean town that's causing the infected to go mad and kill their families is actually the cause of a demonic drifter. What breaks the rules is just how this demonic possession is presented. As mentioned, at first it appears closer to a zombie-like virus, and the drifter himself has to perform a strange ritual every time he he takes a new host. On top of this misdirection is another layer of misdirection, as the real cause of the possession seems to be coming from a ghost taking on the form of a creepy young woman who's seen around the crime scenes. The focus isn't just on one poor victim who needs an exorcist either, but a string of unlucky souls who are targeted, including the main protagonist's young daughter. The wailing constantly has you guessing, and it pulls no punches with its grisly, terrifying finale, Relic. Across the past decade or so, there has been a slew of possession movies that have used the formula to present stories that are really about mental illness, disease, or identity. The likes of The Babadook and The Taking of Deborah Logan are just two examples that blended heavy real-life subjects with the thrills of a good ghost story successfully, but Relic is perhaps the most subversive of the bunch. Part possession movie, part haunted house scarefest, the flick sees mother and daughter duo Kay and Sam moving in with Kay's mother Edna, whose dementia is gradually worsening. However, the pair find themselves trapped in the house and haunted by Edna, who is being taken over from the inside by some kind of supernatural mold. The twist here is how there's no explosive finale, no grand exorcism, or anything like that. Contrarily, the finale sees the family reunited, and instead of running from the force that's been chasing them for the whole film, finally accepting it as part of their lives. The Cleansing Hour. So many movies get the world of social media influencers completely wrong, to the point where you can tell that they're written by out-of-touch geezers who have no idea what TikTok is or how YouTube works. Consequently, they're more cringy than they are entertaining, but The Cleansing Hour is one of the few that really delivers a bona fide horror story set in that world. It centers around The Cleansing Hour itself, a livestream show hosted by supposed priest Max, 
Every week, Max will stream his latest exorcism, ridding the world of yet another demon. In exchange, if you want to, the audience can shoot him a like, share, subscribe, and even buy some branded holy water for good measure. Of course, the whole thing is a complete grift, and Max himself is an arrogant dick coasting off the production prowess of his team. That all changes, though, when a real demon possesses one of the actors, and live on stream threatens to kill the entire production if Max can't exercise it for real. It is is a completely daft premise, but with the right amount of comedy and genuine scares alongside a killer ending that I won't spoil here, it delivers a thoroughly original possession story. Wreck. No, there hasn't been a mix-up. Wreck is supposed to be on this list. I know it might look wrong, I mean after all, it's no doubt been featured front and centre on plenty of lists we've done about zombies, but what makes the story of this seminal found footage horror so captivating is that it blends elements of both zombie stories and possession stories. And that's because, it's revealed towards the end, the virus infecting the inhabitants of this quarantined apartment building is itself a form of demonic possession. The monsters here aren't the living dead, but actually the result of an exorcism that went very wrong and essentially allowed demonic possession to become a contagious illness. There's also a weird worm involved that slips down your throat, but that's much scarier than it sounds, I promise. So, while the Wailing flirted with a similar idea of making demonic possession an illness, Wreck totally committed to that idea and gave us a wholly original genre-bending horror. The Company of Wolves the Company of Wolves is a werewolf movie like no other, as it can best be described as an Inception-esque dreamscape of gothic horror, evoking the fairy tale adventures of the Brothers Grimm. The primary focus of the film is the tale of Little Red Riding Hood. The movie focuses on Sarah Patterson's Rosaline, a modern interpretation of Hood, representing the female victim common in Grimm's fairy tales. Rosaline dreams that she's living in a 17th century gothic village surrounded by a bloodthirsty band of wolves found in the forest. The movie works as a revisionist fairy tale that explores the storytelling methods of female victimhood and yes, there are werewolves. Rosaline's grandmother, as played by the inimitable Angela Lansbury, has filled her head with tales of werewolves saying, they're nice as pie until they've had their way with you, but once the bloom is gone, the beast comes out. The beast definitely does come out and the film is filled with subsequent gore. The company of wolves broke the rules of werewolf movies by restructuring them into a dream within a dream. This makes them into a gory nuance of the plot, which is less about werewolves and more about the way parables control female sexuality and victimhood. Ginger Snaps in nearly every representation of werewolves in film and literature, the beast is a man. That's due to the way werewolves are commonly used to represent the primal rage of men, not women. Ginger Snaps kicks this idea to the curb by making the werewolf a young woman instead of a man. Ginger Snaps is a genre-bending coming-of-age tale told through lycanthropy, which is used as a plot device that explores the intimacies of sisterhood. The pair are slowly torn apart when the older sister is bitten by a werewolf. Due to their age and the nature of the film, the transformation into a werewolf is a meta for female puberty, making the entire movie a commentary on female maturity. It's a high school werewolf story on the surface, but in reality it's so much more than that, and the mould was certainly broken in making it. The movie pays homage to a more Cronenberg style of body horror with a specific focus on American Werewolf in London. The mix of drama and dark comedy serves to elevate Ginger Snaps' commentary that mixes lycanthropy with a loss of innocence into the realm of movies like Heathers and Carrie. Wolfen. Werewolves have long been associated with European culture and history, but that doesn't mean they can't be found in other parts of the world. Wolfen takes the werewolf mythos and reinvents the genre from its European influences, transforming it into a Native American folklore setting. In the film, the Wolfen are an advanced species of wolf capable of exchanging souls with specific tribes of Native Americans. This makes them both animalistic and ritualistic in a way that is unique to werewolf movies. The flick was also the first to employ thermographic imaging, which was later to use more famously in Predator. This made it possible to see the wolf's point of view, as the camera remained close to the ground, only pouncing on its intended victims by taking advantage of their gradient levels of heat. In it, the creatures aren't the typical werewolves seen in other films on this list. Rather, they are something between humans and werewolves. The movie's setting in New York City and the overall ecological theme of Native American tribal appropriation makes what appears to be a horror slasher film into a story far more evocative than what it appears. Wolfen broke many rules in bringing its monsters to life, and it did it in as creative a way as possible. Curse of the Werewolf 1961's Curse of the Werewolf is one of the most interesting werewolf movies ever made. 
and it was also Oliver Reed's first film role. The movie completely turns werewolf standard mythos on its head by removing the more supernatural aspects to create an origin entirely unique to the film's narrative. In the movie, Leon is the product of rape, as his mother was a mute servant who was set upon by an insane and maniacal inmate. At his christening, his presence made holy water boil, and before long he developed a taste for blood, which was a problem that only worsened with age. The movie was released at a time when horror movies were being revitalised. Its contemporaries included classics such as Curse of Frankenstein and The Horror of Dracula, so reshaping the mythos's origin was popular at the time. Still, making the werewolf curse one that came from horrid circumstances certainly broke the standard rules of werewolf movies. Curse of the Werewolf is something of an outlier in the lycanthropy library, but it's also one that shouldn't be skipped when delving into the genre's classics. That being said, depicting children of rape as monsters is really out of touch with what we know today and how we understand victims of rape and sexual assault, so bear that in mind when watching this film, although it is definitely a very interesting way to look at the werewolf myth. Good Manners Good Manners is the most recent werewolf movie on this list, and it's also one of the strangest. In most werewolf films, the beast is a representation of the primal rage of an adult male, but the monster in good manners is a child. The film begins with a woman named Clara interviewing for a nanny job, which she only gets after helping the mother through some pregnancy pain. She continues to help, but notices some odd behaviour. When Anna sleepwalks, she becomes passionate and somewhat violent while craving meat and blood. Anna dies before she can properly deliver the baby, which comes into the world alien style. Clara finds the child in Anna's ruptured abdomen, lovely stuff, and it's a werewolf. Wolf. She takes the baby and raises him while keeping him safe and chained up during the full moon. Fast forward seven years and the young boy werewolf thing becomes determined to find his father. This leads to an outing under a beautiful full moon, a transformation and killing, and a Frankenstein's monster level of rage in the townspeople. Good Manners manages to upend numerous werewolf rules while creating several of its own in the process. As well as a weirdly adorable werewolf baby, this film provides a really interesting outlook on the werewolf story, and is definitely one to watch as as a result. Dog Soldiers. If you've never seen Dog Soldiers and are interested in a brief synopsis, imagine you're watching Night of the Living Dead meets 300 meets Werewolves. What's not to love? The movie is set in the Scottish Highlands and features a squad of soldiers who fight and make a stand against some of the best representations of werewolves in film. The movie relied on practical effects using full body werewolf costumes that would frighten even the dead. The use of practical effects coupled with the constant fear of death at the monster's clawed hands results in an intense action movie steeped in classic horror elements. The soldiers are picked off one by one in an increasingly grisly and gory way, leaving the audience to wonder who, if anyone, will survive. And we can't ignore that amazing twist that really elevates the film along with its depiction of werewolves in a truly terrifying way that hasn't been seen in film for a very long time. The Howling. The Howling is one of those movies that's an easy favourite, but only if you manage to see it. Unfortunately, it was released the same year as An American Werewolf in London, which has earned it something of a retroactive ding in terms of quality when comparing both films' effects. Everything about The Howling is grittier and darker than pretty much every other movie on this list, but it retains some appreciation for the comedic aspects of the work that preceded it. There are numerous campy allusions to both The Wolfman and Frankenstein meets The Wolfman, though it still manages to set itself apart. This is one of those movies people overlooked due to the success of John Landis' British interpretation of the genre, but it's one that should be viewed by any fan of werewolf movies. It's one of those classics that broke the mould by reinventing the interpretation of what a werewolf was, and managing to do it in a hilarious yet equally grotesque manner. Wolf. If you're looking for a werewolf movie that utterly screams 90s cinema, you need to look no further than Wolf. The movie stars Jack Nicholson as a publisher who's just been fired when he gets bitten by an animal on the side of the road. This begins his transformation into a werewolf, so you could easily say he gets the worst day ever. He becomes bolder and more confrontational as the animal inside begins to take control, which makes it unlike typical werewolf transformations found in other films on this list. It also makes the werewolf less of a monster and more of a symbol used to explore the fury that grows within Jack Nicholson's character. The movie manages to do this while remaining fresh and fun, including a hilarious scene where Nicholson marks his territory all over James Spader's shoe. If you're looking for a werewolf movie that's unlike any other, you've found it in Wolf. Teen Wolf. If there's one thing that's remained true of almost every werewolf movie in history, it's that the films are always horrors. They could be suspense, slasher, or something else entirely, but at their very core, the movies are meant to impose fear while telling a story about the nature of rage. 
that's absolutely and completely untrue of Teen Wolf, which is more of a teen comedy than anything else. It displays no horror elements whatsoever outside of initial transformation that's more akin to a teenage boy's confusion than it is about transforming into a hideous beast. Everything about the movie is pure 80s comedy, and it broke so many werewolf rules doing so. It almost doesn't qualify as being part of the genre. Teen Wolf does rely on the trope of the inner beast being more powerful than the person, but it flips the script by the end of the film. Michael Fox's character's reliance on the power he felt as the eponymous Teen Wolf proved unnecessary in winning the basketball game, which was ultimately what the movie was all about, rather than an inner struggle of man versus beast and all that angsty shebang. An American Werewolf in London. Of course, An American Werewolf in London is the gold standard in terms of werewolf movies. The movie was written and directed by John Landis, which isn't a name traditionally associated with horror movies. Fortunately, An American Werewolf in London isn't all about scaring the audience, and there's plenty of dark humour spread throughout. Of course, you can't talk about An American Werewolf in London and not get into its brilliant practical effects. The legendary Rick Baker made those effects possible, earning him the first Academy Award for Best Makeup. The transformations scene is over four and a half minutes long. The primary focus of his transformation from human into werewolf was painful and was a relatively new element into the mythos, as most transformations were fairly quick and relatively painless. The added scope of the dead returning to ask that he kill himself and horrific dreams of Nazi demons killing him and his family definitely broke many of the genre's typical rules. These various added elements elevated the film to classic cult status, arguably making it the best werewolf film ever made. Army of Darkness. Army of Darkness chooses to pick up directly where Evil Dead 2 left us, and follows Bruce Campbell's Ash as he tries to return to his own time after becoming trapped in the Middle Ages. Consequently, Army of Darkness is pretty much a blend of every genre you can think of. The film mixes the standard horror elements with heavy fantasy, romance, comedy, and even some historical period drama to boot. Audiences then, expecting the usual Cabin in the Woods fodder, were shocked by lush gothic production design and huge scale battle sequences between an army of deadites and and medieval knights. Hell, there's even rare Harryhausen-style stop-motion thrown in for good measure. It's all held together by Bruce Campbell's signature performance, but otherwise this is such a mad departure all around from what came before. Doctor Sleep Doctor Sleep could have gone two ways. As a sequel to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, it could have continued where that movie left off, reveling in the same universe that famously made many changes from Stephen King's original novel. It also could have ignored that movie entirely, instead adapting the Doctor Sleep novel and sticking more faithfully to King's story. In the end, however, it kinda did both. The film is at once a lavish love letter to the original movie, recreating scenes outright, relying on the movie's original creations and cinematic language, and delivering a finale that leans heavily on nostalgia. At the same time though, it completely flies in the face of that movie's own rules and story, here putting the focus overtly on supernatural vampire-like beings who live for hundreds of years and get their murder on. What's Left is a weird movie that tries to blend the incongruous takes of both Kubrick and King while also finding room to establish its own identity. It doesn't quite work, but we definitely won't be seeing a sequel slash adaptation like it anytime soon. Saw 3. Saw 3 follows Jeff as he's put through a series of life or death traps involving those responsible for his son's death. At the same time, the dying jigsaw killer abducts a doctor and holds her hostage, tasked with keeping him alive until the game is complete. Saw 3 absolutely swings for the fences, and this time around, genuinely no one is safe, a trait that would admittedly continue throughout later films, but not as effectively. The movie mercilessly kills beloved characters like Detective Alison Carey and Amanda Young, leaving the viewer in utter shock. Perhaps Saw 3's most unique trait though is that it kills the franchise's primary villain as its parting shot. John Kramer is violently murdered in the last scene, and unlike other horror franchises, this serves as a real death. There's no getting struck by lightning or getting peed on here. He's brought back in flashbacks, yes, but killing off the series villain for good less than halfway through the franchise is still something most producers would find unthinkable. So at the end of this movie, every character we know is either dead or left in peril, and the viewer can only scream, where could it go from here? Basket Case 3, The Progeny. 
1991's Basket Case 3 had a very big task on its hands if it was to outdo the bizarre outlandishness of the previous two films, and guess what? It succeeds. The film follows franchise staples Dwayne and his twin Belial along with their community of friends as they travel cross country where Belial's love Eve will birth their children. Basket Case 3 has a plot that gets more and more ridiculous with each passing moment though, and just when you think it can't get any stranger, well it absolutely does. The movie abandons the more traditional horror elements present in the first two flicks, and instead plays as a ridiculous farcical comedy with some occasional gore that's complete with an out of the blue musical number. The movie tops itself in outlandishness however when it opts to parody the Terminator, giving Belial a metal exoskeleton. He then battles police who have taken his newborns hostage and, well, it's a time. No one involved in Basket Case 3 is taking it seriously and it just makes the viewing experience all the more enjoyable. Hello Mary Lou, Prom Night 2. Hello Mary Lou, Prom Night 2 tells the darkly comic tale of Mary Lou Maloney, a high school bad girl who goes up in flames just as she receives her prom queen crown in 1957. Thirty years later, her vengeful spirit targets the naive Vicky for possession to take out those responsible and finally claim her crown. Mary Lou though is about as far from its slasher predecessor as a movie can get, as the concept is completely abandoned in favour of a much more tongue-in-cheek ghost tale. Admittedly though, the shift to a more comedic tone is somewhat refreshing, as by 1987 the slasher subgenre was becoming tired and oversaturated. And even then, although this movie appears to begin as light ghostly fun, it ultimately shocks with some incredibly explicit nudity and equally gnarly gore effects. Genre fans will want to check this one out too for an understated performance by the legendary Michael Ironside who is always awesome without fail. Halloween 2018 I think you all knew this one was coming. The sequel that took a tired franchise and brought it roaring back to life, 2018's mega hit Halloween stands as a direct sequel to the 1978 film of the same name. The movie follows Halloween survivor Laurie Strode as she faces down Michael Myers yet again in a confrontation she has spent four decades preparing for. Now, this wasn't the first time a movie had ignored previous canon. Hell, it's not even the first Halloween movie to do that either, but it was one of the first to do it so extensively and so drastically. This installment dared to wipe the slate clean of all previous character motivations and connections established over 40 long years. It was, as you can imagine, an absolute huge risk, but it ultimately paid off to make the truest, simplest sequel that we had for decades. No longer tied down by complicated familial bonds or druid cults, Michael Myers effortlessly reclaims his status as a motiveless boogeyman. The Town That Dreaded Sundown, 2014. Announced as a remake of the 1976 cult classic of the same name, genre fans were rather shocked to discover that it's actually a sequel of sorts. The movie takes us to the town of Texarkana, where a sack-clad killer again stalks lovers' lanes searching for victims. This raises the question, has the phantom killer returned, or is it a sick fan obsessed with the town's legacy and the movie that it inspired? That's right, the town that dreaded sundown goes super meta and focuses on the lives of those in Texarkana following the years of unwanted publicity generated by the 1976 movie. Residents are shown to absolutely resent this film, fearing it will one day bring blood shed upon their town once again. The writing is admittedly inspired here, tying the cult following of the 1976 film into the horrific true events that the first flick was based on. Sadly, outside of this premise, the movie admittedly isn't all that awesome, and sadly nobody bothered to even see it, but it's still an intriguing piece of work that deserves your time. Rec 3 Genesis after the runaway success of the original two Wreck movies, many were eager to see a continuation of that story. However, this third installment completely dupes the viewer before savagely pulling the rug out from under them. That's because it begins as you would expect in the usual found footage style, but then 20 minutes into the picture the found footage aspect is just dumped when the wedding videographer drops his camera. After this, Genesis boldly decides to just drop the first person perspective entirely and instead plays out like a much more traditional film. Here we have Lush photography, a choral score, and absolutely huge gory set pieces filmed from multiple angles with a hint of evil dead camp to boot. Director Paco Plaza wanted to widen the scope of the series by dropping the core framing and introducing more humorous elements and certainly accomplished that, however as you can imagine, it wasn't to every fan of the original's tastes. Wes Craven's New Nightmare 
New Nightmare at the time was unquestionably a breath of fresh air for a series that had gone very stale. Wanting to break away from the wisecracking media titan that Freddy had become, Wes Craven took the bold step of bringing his creation into the real world, framing the original Nightmare as a movie within a movie. The idea that the real Freddy is now an ancient evil that has endured for centuries is certainly an intriguing one. Craven, along with actor Robert Englund, builds this incarnation of the character as being much more sinister, even more so than was in the first movie. New Nightmare in general has an undeniable sense of grandeur to it, playfully acknowledging fans' investment in the previous lore while presenting something that reframes everything that came before through an at the time groundbreaking meta lens. This movie broke every single rule of an established and beloved franchise and played around with conventions in a way that Wes Craven would fully embrace going into screen. 